So, but I'm going to start um, where one should start with prime numbers, which is the proof that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So, I'm sure everybody here is, knows something about this. So, um, the proof of Euclid, the proof in Euclid's book is simply we assume that we have a finite set of primes, and then we prove that that's wrong. And so we simply multiply them all together, add one. We say, for example, that has a prime factor. Okay, so that prime factor must be in the list, because this is the list of all primes. But then that prime div divides this number, and it divides this number minus one, which means it divides one, which is impossible. That's in Euclid's, um, in Euclid's elements. Actually, he does it with three things here, but that's because he didn't really have notation. <laughs> but it's strange because in mathematical history, sometimes people say, well, he didn't have a complete proof, but you know, he didn't have notation. It's kind of obvious what he meant. Anyway, so what I want to start off tonight is to show you a quite different um, new proof of the infinitude of primes. And actually, I'm going to show you infinitely many proofs. It's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a start. So, if this thing. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, what we're going to want is an infinite sequence of integers with the property that any two of them have no common factors, no prime dividing two of the integers. And I claim if you have such a growing in sequence of integers, you immediately know there are infinitely many primes. Because look, if, well, what we'll do is we'll take one prime factor from each of these integers. And very simply, the proof. <laughs> Okay, no troubles. This is a new clicker, so. Okay, so here's the proof. Um, so what's the proof? Suppose that two of those primes were the same, so in other words, P, X, I, and X, J, had, X, J had the same prime factor, then that prime would divide the greatest common divisor of X, I, and X, J, which is one contradiction. So, to improve our infinitely many primes, all we need is an infinite sequence of integers such that any two of them are co-prime. So the question is, can we cleverly do that? Ooh. Okay. So how do we do it? How do we find such a sequence of integers? And what we're going to do, well, you saw this slide before I got there, but what we're going to do is something very different, which is we're going to do it by dynamical systems. So what is a dynamical system, or at least as far as we're going to go today, is we're going to take a map, which is we're going to send a number like x to x squared minus x plus 1. We're going to study properties of that map. So in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a whole number x, and then I'm going to look at it divided by some number m, and I'm going to look at the remainders when you divide by m. Okay. So let's see how that works out. There we go. So the slide's a bit complicated, but the idea is this. Suppose m divides x. When we transform under this map, well, obviously, when you div if m is divisible by x, the remainder is 0. And then, when you do this map, you get to something that's like 0 squared minus 0 plus 1, which has a remainder 1. <clears throat> and then, what I want to know is if you start with something with remainder 1, you've got remainder 1 squared minus 1 plus 1, so you have a remainder 1. So that's all I'm going to need about this thing now. Okay, so we're going to start with the number x1, we'll call it, say, 2, doesn't matter what, and we're just going to construct integers. x2 is x1 squared minus x1 plus 1, x3 is x2 squared minus x2 plus 1, so it's a very fast growing sequence of numbers. So what happens? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the remainders when I divide xj by xi, so every j after i. So xi is xi. So the remainder when I divide xi by xi is 0. Then xi plus 1, well, I just use this fact up here. If I start off remainder 0, the next number in my sequence, we get remainder 1 when I divide by xi. And then the next one also has remainder 1, because that's the second fact. And we keep on going, they just all have remainder 1. So what does that mean? We've got to think about what that means. <coughs> OK, so um, we may have jumped the slide, but let's not worry. So what we can see just by induction is that the x j's all, j's all have remainder 1 when you divide by x i. So if I look at the greatest common divisor of x i and x j, then because x j leaves remainder 1 when I divide by x i, I can just subtract out multiples of x i, 
and I get remainder 1, so it's the same as the GCD of xi in 1, which is 1. So they have greatest common divisor 1, so it's exactly what I wanted. Okay, this is a bit complicated, but the idea is very simply, I mean, it's complicated with proof, but the idea is very simple. If you solve any integer, we do this map recursively, then the numbers are pairwise co -prime. They have no common factors. And so that means is you can take a prime divisor from each and you put a prime. So that's a proof for <coughs> Let's just see what the sequence of number is. Please. Oh, I'll say the same thing again. So here's an example. If we start with 2, we apply the map, we get 3. We apply the map again, we get 7. 7 squared minus 7 plus 1 is 43. We keep on going. Now, what I want to point out is, Euclid's proof, so let's suppose 2 and 3 were the only primes. 2 times 3 plus 1 is 7. And the first were the only primes. 2 times 3 times 7 plus 1 is 43. So actually, somehow I've got a sequence that's pretty close to Euclid's original proof. But there's a difference. <coughs> I presented it differently, besides anything else. Oops, and I've gone the wrong way. Um, but I can do the same thing for other diagonal systems. So what happens if I go x goes to x squared minus 2x plus 2? I can start from 3, and then I get this sequence of numbers. 3, 5, 17, 2, 5, 7. And what you notice, if you like numbers, is that these are the so-called Fermat numbers. 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1. Actually, both of these methods, both of these sequences, have been used before to prove our infinitely many times. But actually, any dynamical system with certain periodicity properties, and we're going to that, can be used to do the same thing, to prove our infinitely many times. So actually, there's infinitely many like this. I'm not going to go into all the details, but when we say something like that, um, but the thing is, we know very, very little about the sequence of times that comes up. So there is actually quite an interesting research area to open up there. 